Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 is a great chapter. And just as we're reading it through again, I mean, something that just popped out to me was verse 39 is just, uh, is just a great salvation message, right? I mean, verse 39 says, And by him all that what? By him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. So those that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ are justified because we can't be justified by the law. I don't care how good at you are at, at keeping the commandments, you can't be justified by the law. All right, that has nothing to do with the sermon. But it's just something that popped out at me. All right, new series this evening. So we're talking about getting hung up in the Christian life hung up in the Christian life. So what are things that hang you up, that stop you? I mean, why are we coming to church? Why are we learning the Bible? We're trying to move forward in this Christian life. We're trying to become fruitful Christians. We're trying to be people that do something with our lives, right? So that take this one life that we have and actually make it matter for ourselves, our family, other people, right? So what are things that stop us from, from doing that, from, you know, that hang us up in this life. This evening, what I want to talk about is failure. Failure in life is something that hangs a lot of people up. Past failures, especially. All right, so let's look at the story in Acts chapter 13. And the person that I want to use as my main example is this person called John Mark in the Bible. Look at Acts chapter 13. Actually, go back to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 13 mentions him. We'll get to that in a minute. But go back one chapter to Acts chapter 12. Who was this guy named John Mark in the Bible? So we know that he traveled in Acts chapter 13. We know that he traveled with Paul and Barnabas, these great missionaries. You know, Acts chapter 13 has Paul preaching the gospel here to the Jews in the synagogue. But we know that John Mark traveled with Paul and Barnabas. But look at Acts chapter 12 and verse number 25. The Bible says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So his name was John. You'll, you'll hear it. That's kind of like his first name. His surname was Mark. It's kind of a, a last name type of thing, right? So John, Mark, Mark, Marcus. You'll hear him called all these different things in the Bible. But look, let me explain to you the missionary journeys that we see in the books of Acts. First of all, there's, there's mainly, you know, there's three missionary journeys mainly that Paul took that are, that are documented in the book of Acts. If you look back to Acts chapter 13, we see, you know, the first missionary journey of Paul is really what we're, we're seeing in Acts chapter 13. And in this missionary journey, you have these three men together. You have Paul, you have Barnabas, and you have John Mark all together. Okay, but look at Acts chapter 13 and look at verse number 1. The Bible says, now look, I mean, the church at Antioch, you'll hear about this a lot, um, in the book of Acts as well. Here's kind of what happened. So after Jesus was crucified and he came back and then he, he, was, he ascended into heaven, the church at Jerusalem was under some serious persecution. And the Christians scattered from Jerusalem and they started this church at Antioch. And as far as Paul's missionary journeys and Barnabas especially, the church at Antioch was kind of like their home base. So that's why you'll see, you know, Antioch coming up again and again and again in the book of Acts, because Paul would get sent out from Antioch, he would come back to Antioch, and then he'd go out again, and it was kind of like their home church, think of it that way, all right? So look at Acts chapter 13 and verse number 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, that's... Paul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them, and they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. So here's John Mark. Look at verse number 13 of the same chapter, for sake of time, where the Bible says, Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, 
and John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. So at this point we see in the story that you have Paul and Barnabas and John Mark together and like now if you were just normally reading the Bible you wouldn't think all that much about this one verse in verse 13. I mean he could have for some reason John Mark he left at this point and he went back to the church. He didn't go back to Antioch. He went back to the church at Jerusalem. Okay, so that, that's what we know so far at this point. I mean, it could have been for any reason. It could have been for an emergency, you know, whatever. But he got, maybe he got called back to the church for some need or whatever. Honestly, the Bible doesn't tell us what the exact reason was, but turn to Acts chapter 15. So we don't know what we don't know, right? So the Bible doesn't tell us why exactly he left, but we do know this. Look at Acts chapter 15 and verse number 36. We do know this. Look at verse 36 of Acts 15. The Bible says, And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again. So now, they're thinking about going out from Antioch again on another missionary journey. And visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord. They preach the gospel. And see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to do the work. So Paul here is referencing the exact incident in Acts chapter 13 where John left. And the contention, you say, so we don't know why he left. But here's what we do know. Verse 39. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus and Paul chose Silas and they departed being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So we don't know why John left in Acts 13 but we know that the reason was not acceptable to Paul. That's what we know. We know that Paul was not good with it. All right, Paul looked at it, and it was so contentious. Imagine Paul and Barnabas, two of the greatest evangelists in the book of Acts in the entire New Testament, having such a sharp argument amongst themselves that they literally decided not to go together anymore. We're, you go this way, and I'm going this way. But here's another interesting fact about John Mark. Turn to Colossians chapter 4. This shines a little bit of light on the situation for us, on, on why you know, Barnabas took one side and Paul took the other side. Look at Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 10. But I mean, the contention was so sharp. I mean, not only does the Bible say that the contention was sharp, but they literally they, they departed from each other. So you know that something happened. I'm thinking it was pretty uncomfortable for the folks at Antioch when these two men started having contentions that were this sharp. Two, two men of their leadership uh, positions. But look at Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 10. We see a little bit of the reason here why there might have been this contention. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. So here we see that John Mark, Marcus, is Barnabas's nephew. It's his sister's son. So, you know, Barnabas was like the favorite uncle, I suppose. He was kind of looking out for his sister's son. It definitely shines some light on the situation. And then people will constantly say, well, who was right? Who was right in the situation between Paul and Barnabas? And the answer is this. They both were. They were both right. I mean, Paul's take was... He was serious. I mean, Paul, I mean, if you understand anything about Paul, he is a hard-charging man in the Bible. He is a hard-charging man. He is there to get a job done. It didn't matter how many times they tried to kill him. They tried to beat him. He just got right back up and went right back into the synagogue. I mean, he'd been stoned. He had been whipped. I mean, you name it, he went through it. He was serious about his commitment to the gospel. And he just simply did not trust somebody who left him when he was in the midst of that mission. Barnabas' take, you know, give the guy another chance. You know, it's my sister's kid. 
I mean, Barnabas was, you know, the favorite uncle to, to Marcus, and he's just trying to give the kid another chance. And you know what? I mean, Barnabas turned out to be right, too. Barnabas turned out to be right. So look, you have to understand that, you know, how did this, let's look at this whole situation with John Mark. Imagine you have just disappointed the, the greatest evangelist to ever live. I mean, just think of the greatest Baptist preacher you can ever even think of. And you went to serve him or work for him or whatever, and you just fell on your face and you failed and you quit. I mean, that's kind of the equivalent of what happened with John Mark and Paul. But turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let's see how, you know, I mean, he doesn't even, Paul didn't even want him with him anymore. He's like, I'm not going with him. He wasn't just mad at him. He's like, I'm not going with him. I don't want him with me. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a massive letdown right there. But look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. How did it work out for John Mark? How did it end up for John Mark after such a major failure? The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, written by Paul, look at verse number 11. He says, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Turn to Philemon chapter 1. So here we see somewhere between the contention between Barnabas and Paul in the book of Acts and 2 Timothy chapter 4, we see that Mark has, you know, become profitable again for the ministry. Look at Philemon chapter 1 and look at verse number 24. Or 23 we'll start. The Bible says, There salute thee Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. So Paul's in jail. Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. He's back working with Paul. He got the job back. So he came back from such a failure. He says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, be with your spirit. Amen. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. It gets even better. It gets even better. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 11. So not only did John Mark redeem himself with Paul to where he was laboring next to Paul again, but he made a name for himself in Jerusalem as well with Peter. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 11. The Bible says to him, Be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son. He calls Marcus his own son. That's how close he is to him. So Marcus has, has redeemed himself amongst the men of, of the New Testament. Now look, here is some history, some, some secular history for you. Now this isn't the Bible, but this is what secular history says about what happened to John Mark. Okay, look, the Gospel of Mark was written by this guy. This is the Mark that wrote the Gospel of Mark. Jerome, a historian, speaks, Thus Mark, a disciple of Peter, at the request of the brethren at Rome, wrote a brief gospel according to that which is that according to that which he had heard Peter relate. So Peter supposedly through secular history related the gospel to Mark. When Peter examined it, he pronounced it good. Upon his word, he gave it to the church to read. The gospel of Mark, right there. Afterwards, when Mark was sent by Peter to Egypt, this is actually in the martyr's mirror, that in the eighth year of Nero, so he was sent to Egypt to preach the gospel by Peter, that in the eighth year of Nero, when he at the feast of the Passover preached the blessed remembrance of the suffering and death of Christ to the church at Alexandria, that, keep in mind, this is the guy that quit on Paul. This is the guy in Acts 13 that just quit on Paul, and Paul was so upset with him, he didn't want to take him on the next missionary journey. So he's preaching in Egypt. He's preaching in Alexandria. The heathen priests and the whole populace seized him, and with hooks and ropes, which they fastened around his body, they dragged him out of the congregation, through the streets, and out of the city, so that his flesh everywhere adhered to the stones. 
and his blood was poured out upon the earth. And they that again thrust him, they that they then again thrust him still alive into prison, whence he having been strengthened and comforted by the, by the Lord in the night. So he's thrown into prison after going through this, this situation. The Lord strengthens him in the night. He was then taken out again and dragged to the place Bakuli until he, with the last words of the Savior, isn't that interesting? I mean, this is secular history, but it matches up with what the Bible says God's going to do for us in those times. He, with the last words of the Savior, committed his spirit into the hands of the Lord and expired. So he ended very well, I would say. He ended strong. He finished his race well. So all that, as introduction to say this, you know, for application for us, let me just give you a few points from the Bible on how failure should affect you in your life. You say, well, I've failed a lot. Well, let's just look at a few points in the Bible and from the life of John Mark on how you should take failure in your life. And the first one is this. Failure in life at no point should dictate future success. I mean... John Mark, I mean, it, could, could you imagine a more complete redemption? I mean, look, he had a low point. He had a low point. But look, it takes time to redeem your reputation. It takes time to redeem failures. It doesn't happen overnight. But look, getting back up, going and reproving yourself, all those things. Look, he ended up with Paul again, working with Paul in the ministry. The very guy that he left and the very guy that wanted to have nothing to do with him. He ended up back with him. That is success. That's full circle redemption right there to Paul. Look, if he would have buried his head and focused on his failure, he never would have done anything where he could have moved forward. He redeemed himself amongst all the brethren. I mean, that's impressive. And he was even sent out by Peter and ended his life, you know, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, no matter what the cost. He never stopped. He never said, oh, these people are getting mad. I better not preach exactly what, you know, the Bible says. I better water it down. No, he said what the Bible said. He preached the gospel, and it cost him his life. And he, he went out... Like, like an apostle. Like an apostle should. Look, here's the second point. Failure may mean a different path forward for you. There are certain failures that may mean a different path forward, but still a path forward. An example of this is like divorce is a failure in, in someone's past. right? Say you get divorced. Okay, say you wanted to be a pastor one day. Say you wanted to go into the ministry and be a pastor of a church, but then you end up getting divorced. Well, you can't be a pastor now, according to the Bible. Right. You're no longer qualified for that. But look, God has a plan B for your life. God has a plan B, and if you mess up plan B, God has a plan C, and if you mess up plan C, God has a plan D, and a plan E, and a plan F. Look, hopefully you don't get to run out of the alphabet. But, you know, God always has another plan for you. It's just, it's, it's up to you to get up and move forward. And, you know, look, here's the thing about, you know, going into the ministry and becoming a pastor. You know how many, you know how many uh, pastors this church needs? One. You know how many people are needed to serve faithfully in this church? A lot. So, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, maybe there's a little bit too much emphasis put on, you know, that oh, everybody has to go into the ministry. Everyone has to be a pastor. No, I mean, look, the church, the church, this church, Jesus Christ Church with this candlestick needs one pastor, but it needs multiple people to serve, to help. I mean, look, the, the, the church needs more people to serve than it needs than, than a pastor. So, I mean, look, I mean, it's... It's just, it's just, so if you're not qualified to be a pastor, I mean, so what? I mean, the church needs people to serve. 
in all different kinds of areas. So, I mean, plan B, plan C, plan D, plan E, there's always a plan there for you. Okay, that's the beauty of the Christian life. But you can't stop, you have to get back up and keep moving forward, or you're not going to make plan anything. The third point is this, if, and, and here's the thing that people really need to get, right? In all aspects of life, if you aren't failing, you aren't participating. If you aren't failing, you aren't participating. One of my favorite quotes from any president throughout the history of the whole United States is a quote that Teddy Roosevelt gave in 1910. My dad, I remember, had it on in his office. And he had it on the wall in his office. And it reads like this. It's called The Man in the Arena. And this is what it means. Or this is what it says. This is from Theodore Roosevelt. So whatever you say about Theodore Roosevelt, this man was a tough character. I mean, he wasn't messing around. And, I mean, he was a tough man. And he knew how to, to get things done through failure. Now, listen to this quote. He says this. He says, it is not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error or shortcoming. There's a man who's failed a few times. There's no effort without error or shortcoming, but who actually does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. So his place shall never be known with those cold and timid souls that neither know victory nor defeat. That's a great quote. So many people will never know success because failure has defined their future. I mean, that's why so many people quit at things. I mean, anybody from the secular world to the Bible will tell you that the road to success is paved in failure. But the trick is this. The trick is this. The trick is learning how to minimize those failures and to get over them quickly and move forward. That's the trick. Look, I've had some, I've had some good ideas in my life. But here's the rule that I've, that I've learned. I've learned that out of the ideas that I have, about one in 10 is good. You say one in 10. So the trick to success for me is learning how to deal with those nine failures and recognize that one. So you gotta, look, here's the thing. You gotta deal with the nine. You gotta quickly realize it's a failure, quickly put it behind you, and quickly move forward. You can't dwell on one of those nine. You can't get depressed about one of those nine. You gotta just recognize it's not gonna work, it was a bad idea, and just move on. Now look, there, there may be smarter people than me, there may be dumber people than me. Maybe some people have every two ideas out of 10, or every three ideas out of 10 are good. But they still have to deal with those seven. And if they're not any good at dealing with those seven, they're not going to move forward. I mean, that's the bottom line. I've seen so many people like that. Maybe people have one in 20, but they can't deal with the 19. It doesn't matter. You have to deal with the failures. You have to deal with the failures, and you have to quickly move forward. Turn to John chapter 21. Turn to John chapter 21. Look, even Peter, even Peter, I'll just give you one example. I mean, Peter, Peter failed a, a, a few different times in the Bible. But look at uh, John chapter 21. Look at verse number 3. This is, you know, Jesus has been crucified. You know, everybody's just, they're like, what in the world? Jesus has just risen from the dead. Not everybody knows about it. And, you know, Peter, like the, 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 the big shot, one of the leaders of the disciples, 
Look at John chapter 21 and verse number 3. The Bible says, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. He went forth and entered a ship immediately, and then at the night they caught nothing. So, I mean, after this whole thing, Jesus has been crucified. I mean, it, it's just everything's a train wreck. It doesn't look like it's going well at all. He's like, I'm going fishing. And he takes a bunch of the guys with him. I mean, of course, we know how it turns out. Jesus shows up. You know, they catch a bunch of fish. They, they, you know, they realize it's the Lord. Peter gets it right and moves forward. It moves forward with his life. But look, Peter messed up too. Any of the greats of anything, none of the greats made it without failing. I mean, think of these guys. Mark, Peter. I mean, that's, I mean you recognize the names because there's books of the Bible named after them. They're main characters in the Bible. Turn to Luke chapter 9. Look, it's, it's, it's a mat. It's just, if you're participating, you're, you're going to fail. If you're in it, you're going to fail. Look at Luke chapter 9 and verse number 57. Luke chapter 9 and verse number 57. The Bible says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto the other, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go bury my father. I mean, that seems like a reasonable request. Can I go bury my father? Jesus saith unto him, Let the dead bury their dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. <laughs> hey, let's get moving. He's like, let the dead bury the dead. Let the unsaved bury the unsaved. There's still people breathing on this earth that need to hear the kingdom of God, that need to hear the gospel preached. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but first let me go bid them farewell, which are at my home and my house. Let me go say goodbye. And Jesus said unto him, look, does this sound like this guy, this long-haired hippie that's just like, you know, carrying a sheep around all the time and just like, love everybody? Oh. No, he's like, he's dropping hammers on people. He's telling people, look, this is what it's going to take. You want to follow me? This is what it's going to take. He's like, you want to go and you want to waste time? Burying, burying somebody who is not even saved? Let the dead bury the dead. He's like, you want to waste time? Go on. He's like, there's work that needs to be done. Look, Jesus cared about people going to heaven. Amen. And, he's, and he's, he's, he's showing the urgency here. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. He's like, look, if you're going to be this guy that comes with me and goes to preach the gospel, and you're, always, and you're like, oh, I miss my mommy, and uh, you know, all this kind of stuff, he's like, it's not going to work out. He's like, because we're going to put our hands to the plow, and we're going forward. I mean... He's like a drill sergeant here. He's like, we're not going to look back. And that leads me to my last point, is that your past failures should not define your future. Your past failures should not define your future. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. And I don't care what those failures are. If you I don't care what your failures were or if they were yesterday. If you are saved today, those failures should not define where you go in the future. Amen. Period. Look at verse number uh, 13 of Philippians chapter 3. I mean, now think about who this is coming from. This is coming from Paul. Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 13. Is everybody there? Brethren, I count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, I count not myself to have apprehended. He's like, I'm not there yet. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Did Paul have some failures? We'll talk about those failures in, in a couple sermons from now in this same series. But forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the, pro high pro the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Look, Paul is like, I'm not there yet, but he's pressing towards the mark. Now look, here's the thing. I don't care what kind of pressing that you're doing, there will always be risk in pressing. 
There will always be risk in pressing. Whenever you're pressing against something, you're pushing. I remember I used to wrestle in high school. And you would always want somebody to, to push on you. I would love it if somebody came into a wrestling match and started pushing on me and pushing me. Because it's really easy just to throw somebody when they come pushing at you. Because they're using their own weight towards you. And you just throw them to the ground. Super easy. You don't have to do any work. So there's risk in pressing. You're pressing on something, you're working on your car. I mean, how many times are you pressing on something and bah, my knuckles? You're pressing, I mean, there's risk in pressing. You hit yourself, you cut yourself. I mean, I can feel it right now. It hurts, but look, here's the thing. Here's the nice thing about church. Hopefully you can press forward without failing so much. If you're in a good church, you're, you're looking, you know, you're, you're learning, you're growing. But look, unless you've figured out the sinless life, please don't come out, come here and say you figured out the sinless life. But in, until you figure out this, how to get rid of this flesh, this sin that we have, you know what, you're going to fail. You're going to fail in this Christian life. I mean, think of Mark. I mean, just, just imagine today, let me just, like, Think of Mark and Peter. Think of, I mean, they quit the ministry. Think of someone today quitting the ministry. What would you think of them? What would you think of somebody today that quit the ministry? Like, I've, look, I've heard of people doing that, and you have too, of people quitting the ministry. I'm not talking about, you know, getting kicked out of the ministry. I'm just talking about people that just quit the ministry. I've heard of it happening, and, I mean, I've thought it myself. I'm like, man... How are they going to come back from that one? But look, these men came back from that kind of low point. You know, the, these men that have quit the ministry that, that we know about, that we've heard about, they should come back. They should come back from it. I mean, men in the Bible did. Mark and Peter did. They came back and they did great. Look, and here's another thing in this Christian life. The more out on a limb you go, the more responsibilities you take on yourself, the more you decide, I'm going to serve, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take on this new service, I'm going to do this for the church, I'm going to decide to serve in this way. The more you grow and, and give to the Christian life as you should, your failures, it, it seems like they're more visible. It seems like they're more visible. But look, does it, does it matter? It doesn't change the fact that you should put those things behind you and move forward. Amen. Mark and Peter failed. They jumped back in and became amongst the greatest men in the entire Bible. I mean, there's no doubt about it. So look, in conclusion this evening, especially, like, especially for the person out here that has failed at things in a past life. You know, before, say, before you were saved. You, you had some failures in your life. Look, the Bible says you're a new creature now. I mean, the Bible says, I mean, just think about it. I mean, people have failed at major things in their life. They've failed at marriage. They've failed at raising children. I mean, these are major things. Like, you, you need to just, you need to get things as right as you can, and you need to move forward. I mean, some things you're just not going to be able to fix overnight. You're not just going to be able, and some things, you know, just aren't going to be fixed, right? It's going to be plan B time. It's going to be plan C time. But look, maybe it means that you just won't be able to get remarried. You know, plan B. Maybe that means you have a long road mending relationships. I know Christians who have, have gotten right after their kids are 20. Now they got a long road to mend relationships. Look, it's better not to go down those roads, but you can't let that past failure stop you from moving forward in the future. You get things as right as you can. You do things the right way from now on. Look, maybe that means that you won't be a pastor. But look, you know what? Does it take a, I mean, does it take a pastor to go out and preach the gospel? I mean, do we need more people to go out and preach the gospel? Or don't we? I mean, I met a kid. I mean, look, we will teach you. We will teach you how to go out and and get people from heaven to hell or hell to heaven i'm sorry we will teach people 
We will teach you how to get people out of this situation that they're in. Amen. It, look, it doesn't take, it doesn't take a, a college degree. It doesn't take paying a bunch of money. It doesn't look, we met, we met a kid a couple months ago that he was just so obsessed with all so these online ministries and sending this money to these and following all these online guys that were just like, you have to do this and this and this. It's like, look, we'll make you a missionary here. It, it's free. Look, we'll send you across the world. Here. We'll teach you how to do something with your life here. But look, if you take, and look, God doesn't hold these past failures against you. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He doesn't hold these past failures against you. But guess what? If you use them as excuses going forward, he will. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17. The Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Look, the Bible says that God, God doesn't hold these things against you, these failures in the past. But look, if you are in this Christian life and you've been given this gift of salvation and you just say, you know what, um, I'm going to obsess over my past failures and I'm going to do nothing with this gift, then God's going to hold that against you now. Right. Now you're in chastisement territory. So you must press towards this mark. You can also, you know, not be afraid of future failures either. You know, when you set a path, a goal, it just needs to be a matter of when you get there, not if. And that's the problem with people today. You know, they set a goal and they're like, oh, I wonder if I'll ever get there. No, you just set a goal. You just purpose in your heart and it, whatever. You just keep going until you get there. Amen. Fail a test, bummer, take it again. Amen. Fail it again, take it again. Amen. Again, take it again. I know people who have taken certain tests 15 times. I know one guy is like the most persistent person I've ever met has taken a test like 18 times. I'm like, man, maybe it's just not for you. But it's like he just keeps taking it. He's going he's gonna to get it. He's going to get it. Start a new job. I mean, there's some of you starting new jobs. Look, you're probably not going to get it right for a while. Let me just let you know. You're probably not going to get this. Look, if it's a job worth having, you're probably not going to get it right the first day. I remember the first job that I ever had out of college. I thought I was a moron for like two years. I, went, I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding. Ask my wife. I went home to my wife every, like, on a, on a bi-weekly basis, and I'm like, I'm an idiot. I don't understand this stuff. It's like, am I stupid? Like, it's, it's so complicated, I can't understand it. For like two years. And I'm doing stuff wrong. And look, it's just, you just keep grinding. That's it. Parenting. You set a goal to homeschool and you just do it. That's what you do. You set a goal to homeschool and you just, you just fail your way through it. That, that's what you do. When we first started homeschooling, there was no support. When we first started homeschooling, it was us. That's it. It was, it, people were against it. People in our family were against it. People in the little town that we live close to were against it. Everybody was against it. We just started doing it. We're all by ourselves. We didn't have any support. We're pretty much on our own. Look, you have support, by the way. You will fail less. But there will be times, there will be days when you will think you're not a good teacher. There will be days when you're like, you know what? I don't have the temperament for this. Does God really want me to homeschool my kids? Yea, hath God said. That's what that is. Yes, God wants you to homeschool. I mean, that's the goal, to homeschool your kids. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6. I'll just read it for you. And these words, this is for you, Mom. And these words, what I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. When? When thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. It is your job. It is what God said. Right there. I mean, look, that's for you, homeschool mom. It doesn't matter how much you fail. That's the beauty of the Word of God, by the way. You know, your emotions change. Our feelings change. The Word of God never changes. 
It's always right there telling us that's what you need to do. So when you're like, oh, am I really cut out for this? Am I really supposed to do this? Yes, because it's right there and it doesn't change. It doesn't change with our feelings or our inadequacies. You know, we should just always revert back to it to bring us back around. Always. Back to the Word of God. Look, some people just have a lot of quit in them. That's the bottom line. If this is you, you need to fix this. Or you'll ruin a lot of things. You just need to become the type of person that just doesn't get hung up on past failures. Because that failure could be five minutes ago. <laughs> I, I mean... You guys starting new jobs, let me, give you a, let me give you another piece of advice on this new job thing. I know it's relevant right now. When I moved from North Dakota to Sacramento, I got this job. And I was like, it was a miracle that I got the job. I was ready to go work. We were talking about it today. I was going to go, had a couple backup plans. But I ended up getting this job. And I got into that job, and I hated it. I hated it. Every single day, I was just like, I hate this. I can't believe I'm doing this. And I wanted to go, and I wanted to get a different job. And I wanted to, I even met with some other people and like had some opportunities to get a different job, but I just couldn't get over this idea that God provided this job for me. I mean, it was so profound a uh, moment in my life. I was just like, you know, God just provided this job for me, so I'm just going to grind it out. And I decided not to leave and just grind it out at this job. And out of that job came opportunity and an opportunity that allowed me to get the job that I have here. Isn't that weird? Here I was like, this is the worst job ever. My pride was all like, man, you, 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 you don't, don't they know who you are? Why are they making you do this stuff? You know, I mean, my pride was all messing with me and all this, but no, this is the, God, the job that God provided for me. So I'm just going to stay there. So look, get a job. God provides you a job and just stick with it. Just stick with it and just grind it out. You fail, own it. Move on. Fail again, repeat. It's not complicated. And soon you will begin to fail less. And that is how like Mark and Peter and Paul, you know, you'll reach that mark that you're pressing towards. I mean, failing, look, here's the thing. I mean, failing will happen to us if we're participating. If you, like, you're not going to fail if you're not participating. Because you, you're, you know, as far as the man in the arena goes, you're that cold and timid soul. You're that cold and timid soul who will ne never know victory nor defeat. So you must get up and move forward. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what we see from these men. Look, these stories in the Bible aren't just there for us to read and just, oh, that's a cool story. These stories are in the Bible because this is stuff we're going to go through. This is stuff we're going to go through. Look, there's going to be failures in your Christian life. There's going to be failures in your, your, your family life. There's going to be failures. Look, we want to fail less. We don't want to fail by, you know, falling into horrible things or whatever. We want to fail less. That's what we're trying to do by preaching the Bible here. Get you to fail less, but when you fail, you need to get up and go forward. Amen. That, that's, what, that's what Jesus taught. Because look, we need to move forward. Forward, forward in front of us is so much I can hardly imagine it. We can't afford to have anybody laying on the ground crying about their failures. There's too much to do in front of us. We were coming up on a one-year anniversary here. One day we'll be an independent church, God willing. There's a lot of work to do. Amen. There's a lot of, I mean, it's intimidating to me how much is in front of us. I, I need help. We, I, I, we can't afford to have Brother George laying on the ground in a pile, Amen. Right. crying about his failure yesterday. Amen. We can't afford to have anyone doing that. So we want to fail less, but move forward together. Look, people's, I mean, people's eternity depends on it. Think about it. If we have a third of the people here that are depressed and not moving forward, I mean, that's going to matter for people in Fresno. Yeah, but if we have everybody here moving forward in the right direction, in unison, Amen. then, I mean, sky's the limit. Right. Amen. And God will be with that. That's why God tells us to put our hand to the plow and, and don't look back. Right. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.